We heard on yesterday's keynote from the Secretary of State, Chris Grayling. Uh, he was talking about uh, funding for network rail in CP6, how there's actually going to be more money around in the next control period than there was in this one, but how it's going to be uh, distributed differently from the way it has been over the past few years. That, of course, has uh, a knock-on effect on the infrastructure industry uh, on, and how they get their money and in what, uh, in what, uh, what rate, um, and so on, how they can plan training, how they can plan um, equipment and everything else they need to do to gear up to deliver the various projects. So we're going to hear about a bit more about that today. We, there'll be time for questions at the end, by the way, so if you have a question, please hold it till then. Uh, but to talk about the challenges and opportunities for that rail supply chain and the infrastructure industry, no one better than the Managing Director of uh, Balfour BT Rail and Utilities, Mark Bullock. Mark. Thank you, Nigel. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Nigel said, I'm here today to give you a, a perspective on the rail, UK rail industry and its challenges. Uh, from the perspective of an infrastructure contractor. Um, I'd like to cover the various issues of skills, innovation and devolution if I can uh, and we'll see where that gets us. Um, so as I just said, my name is Mark Bullock. I'm the Managing Director of Balfour BT Rail and Utilities. I have the great privilege to lead some 5,000 amazing people who deliver almost a billion pounds of work on critical infrastructure in the UK each year. Now, as people in railway, I guess you'll all be used to us saying, we're living in interesting times. We always seem to, us, to say to ourselves, it's an interesting time at the moment in the railways. But I think at the moment, it really is interesting times, maybe more interesting than in the past. Um, there are a huge amount of people that rely on the railways. A massive amount of freight is transported. I think if you look back 10 years now compared to 10 years ago, about 40% more passengers, 60% more freight. The numbers are absolutely mind-boggling that our industry deals with. Our sector contributes 36.4 billion of gross value added to the UK economy. We provide employment for 600,000 people. And that employment and the work that we all do generates some 11 billion pounds that we give to the tax man. I'm not quite sure why, that always feels uncomfortable when I say that bit, but that's a lot of money that we're putting back into the economy. Um, and of course, a healthy transport infrastructure is essential to a thriving UK economy not only does it keep uh, commerce, the wheels of commerce turning, but it enables people to go about their day-to-day -day lives uh, safely. As we move from one control period to another, record levels of investment have been announced in the railways. Um, and also, there's a desire that's been expressed to bring private sector funding into our marketplace, probably for the first time. Although how that's going to work, I don't think anybody's quite sure yet, but it'd be interesting to see how that develops. So, as I said, we're in interesting times. Now, whilst it is, of course, a very positive thing that we're seeing such a high level of investment in the railways, it does, of course, bring a huge challenge to the supply chain. As well as the 48 billion pounds that Network Rail have announced they intend to spend in CP6, most of which will be, which will be on renewals, uh, which is a change in emphasis. Um, there are also some big exciting enhancement schemes in the pipeline. HS2 is the very obvious one that becomes more and more a reality every day. Uh, but uh, other projects such as Crossrail 2 in the, in the horizon as well. These mega projects are hugely complex. They're incredibly risky, uh, very expensive, and pose some unique engineering challenges. In order to meet those challenges, we'll require large numbers of skilled and experienced workers, uh, and coupled with that, a huge investment in innovation and plant. We need competent, tried and tested, experienced tier one contractors backed by a strong supply chain if we're to deliver these schemes to build the world-class railway 
that sits at the heart of the government policy. If the critical supply chain is to thrive and survive through CP6 and beyond, we need continuity of work, we need certainty of order book, uh, and we need clarity of future priorities, programs, and spending levels. That brings me on to skills. The investment in our industry is driving the demand for engineering and other skills in the sector. We need not just people with rail experience and expertise, but skills that are also currently deployed in other markets. This is helping to challenge the image of, of, of the railway, which maybe some would say is somewhat old fashioned. Uh, we need to refresh that image. We need to recognize that in today's world, we are competing with other sectors and other options when it comes to, uh, uh, to career aspirations for the younger generation. We need to attract those people into our industry. Now, I guess we all know that rail offers a large variety of exciting career opportunities, different challenging roles, um, but I think we all, we all owe it to ourselves and to our industry to drive change around the image. Um, what we need is a more inclusive approach. We need a more flexible and a more diverse workforce to meet the demands of the future. Brexit also will have an impact. Um, I, I've, I've read various places that somewhere between 15 and 20% of our workforce is currently sourced from EU countries. Uh, the impact that uh, Brexit will have on that uh, labor force will be interesting to see, uh, but it's quite significant. And this increasing demand for skills, coupled with reducing supply, has, and will continue to do so, drive up costs uh, in the sector with a consequent negative impact on labor productivity. Retention of core skills is one of the reasons why it's essential to the supply chain that we have continuity of work. We must find a way to smooth out the peaks and troughs in demand I've worked in a number of regulated sectors during my career, and the one thing that they all have in common, in my experience, is the cyclical nature of demand as you transition from one regulatory cycle to the next. Um, Demobilising and remobilising significant workforces on a regular basis is not an effective or, co or, or an efficient way to run an industry. If you take the absence of an enhancements pipeline currently and into the start of CP6 for Network Rail as an example, the impact on the supply chain of such a downturn in activity, followed by an increase at some point in the future when those schemes come to the market, make it very difficult for contractors to retain key skills. It makes it very difficult for those skills to be available as and when they're needed. There is a very real risk that key people will drop out of our industry and seek employment elsewhere, precisely at the time when we really, really need them. Um, if you look at HS2 and Crossrail 2, the demand for, for resources on, on those jobs is absolutely colossal. Phenomenal opportunities for people to, to build careers and, and do a great job. Uh, but my, my fear is that if we see a dip in workload for the next couple of years, when the market needs those people, they may well not be there. They would have gone somewhere else and sought alternative career opportunities, which I think would be tragic. So we need greater and more reliable visibility of planned investments from government and our customers to enable, to enable us to better plan our businesses and resources, to recruit, train, develop, and retain the best and brightest staff and to support investment in dis decisions for both innovation and plant. Um, so on the subject of innovation then, one key area that will benefit from the massive investment going into the rail uh, is innovation. I think it will give British companies great opportunities to develop their products and offerings uh, and to ultimately export those uh, great products and offerings around the world. There's a significant opportunity for the sector. The size and number of the schemes should, if they're commissioned well and sequenced effectively, 
result in leaps forward in cutting edge rail technology. That will help companies develop world leading uh, technologies and projects to export around the world. And I guess as you look around today, you're going to see many examples of, of those in action. Not only will it improve the sector's competitiveness, but it will increase productivity. In the past, rigid adherence to gold-plated engineering standards and cumbersome, pro cumbersome procurement regulations have stood in the way of this creativity being unleashed. And I guess also the lack of incentives uh, for suppliers to invest in, uh, in introducing innovation uh, needs to be addressed as well. So, what does this mean? I think our aim should be to establish the UK's position as a world leading centre of rail innovation and excellence and to export those skills and knowledge around the world. Um, and without wanting to sound like a broken record, the more certainty the supply chain has over its order book, the programmes it's got to deliver, its future spending requirements, the better able is it to plan its resources and invest in innovation accordingly. So I guess at the moment a hot topic is devolution. Um, devolution offers significant opportunities for the rail way the railway infrastructure um, is organised on a regional basis. I think it will bring forward better ways to, to order priorities, to service the needs of passengers ultimately. Improved connectivity will be even more important, I think, post-Brexit. But more than this, Brexit offers a golden opportunity to take strategic action to strengthen the economy by investing in better transport links across the country. We need a strong nation, not just a strong capital. To achieve this, there are things which need to evolve. So, for example, the uh, benefit-cost ratio processes that are used to allocate funding to schemes can be over-reliant on narrow financial criteria, um, rather than considering the wider social and economic benefits, uh, such as job creation in the regions, uh, gross value added uh, for new infrastructure. The tools are out of date and need to be updated and expanded to include economic development uh, as a priority. By doing that, we can ensure prosperity and growth for the whole of the economy, not just certain parts of it. I guess another key reason for regional funding differences is fragmented regional decision making across the country. So kind of I'm into politics here. Um, the de but the devolution agenda has real potential to improve infrastructure outside the capital. Um, especially where we see sub-national bodies such as Transport for the North and Midlands Connect come, in, uh, come into play, taking a strategic view and a coordinating role in the regions. And whilst a one-size-fits-all solution is not appropriate, I think giving regions the power to decide what is appropriate for them and their populations is the right way forward. And ultimately, I think we'll see better investment decisions. In the long term, I guess, the aim must be for Transport for the North to be given similar powers to Transport for London, to borrow money, to fund investment, uh, and for regional infrastructure disparities to be levelled. These bodies must be able to finance infrastructure projects themselves and also be able to drive private sector investment. And on the subject of devolution, Network Rail itself is also undergoing um, uh, a kind of evolution. It's becoming a more devolved business in order to better respond to its customers' needs. I think ultimately that's a good thing too. Uh, putting the power and the authority to make decisions closer to the customer, uh, as a businessman to me that makes absolute sense, why wouldn't you do that? Um, but it, it, we, we will see change coming from that uh, and I guess it may take time for it to work through. But. This local focus combined with the opening up to funding and financing mechanisms, um, delivery of investments and schemes by third parties, I think will ultimately help to drive efficiencies and value for money for the taxpayer into the sector. So, in conclusion, as I said at the outset, we're in interesting times, um, but I think we're also in exciting times to work in the rail industry. We have many challenges, 
but I think this is a great industry to be working in. The things we do make a massive difference to people's lives. Those of us who work in the infrastructure side take great pride to be building a legacy for the future. What we're doing today is creating career opportunities for our children and our grandchildren. I think that's fantastic. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and maybe we've got time for Q&As if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Yeah, thanks again. It's, it's always interesting to hear from the, the people at the sharp end, if you like, <laughs> and how they view things. We do have time for some questions, so if you do, please stick a hand out and we'll get the microphone to you. Uh, Mark, before we start those questions, your role is Managing Director of Rail and Utilities. You referred to the fact you've worked in other regulated air industries and they all have their control periods and their ups and downs and so yeah. What lessons can rail learn from those other utilities? I mean, they're doing very much the same job. They're building tunnels, they're, they're digging ditches, all that sort of thing. Um, are there lessons to learn? Are there safety lessons to learn? Are there procedural lessons to learn? Yeah, I think there's, um, I think there's always lessons to, to learn in life generally. So I've worked, uh, I've worked both client side and, and asset owner side. Uh, and contractor side, and um, I've worked in aviation, power, and rail. Uh, and they are very similar, actually, in many ways. So these are large, uh, large organizations dealing with critical infrastructure that has massive social implications. You know, if it's working, you don't notice it, but if it's not working, it's, you know, it's headline news. Um, they're regulated because they're natural monopolies and all those kind of things. What, what I'd say I find quite different in rail is rail to me seems much more politically driven. In the other sectors I've worked, it's, they've been much more of a commercial approach to life and less political interference. Um, I guess maybe that's something to do with the state of our railways through decades of underinvestment, you know, not enough capacity to meet current need, let alone future need, and all the pressures that puts on it. But the railways do seem to be under quite a lot of political uh, focus, which can sometimes get in the way. Um, but there are lots of lessons to learn um, from an engineering point of view, from a safety point of view, from a delivery point of view, definitely. Good, and uh, I suppose political interference has good and bad points. It's, it, it can. The, the goalposts can move too often, so that, that, that's a bad thing. But equally, politically, they like to be seen to be giving money away. So uh, sp spending money on solving the problems, I should Indeed, say. Yeah, 48 so, billion for network rail is, is welcome, I would say. Yes, it's not a, not a small number. Do we have some questions for Mark, please? Just get your microphone, so if you could say who you are and who you represent today. Hello, Arthur Broadberry from c Consulting. Mark, you mentioned about cost and benefit ratios and how they're out of date. Uh, if, was, if that's going to change, are you looking particularly at network rails approach or a political government approach? Yeah, my, my comments, Arthur, were aimed at, um, at, at government, so it's, treasury, it's the treasury models that I was referring to. Um, and the, and the narrow, a, a, a too narrow focus on just financial outcomes tends to favor those areas where you've got dense population so, I mean, the obvious example is London, you know, using those models would direct all the spend into London and neglect the rest of the country, which I don't, you know, that might be an economically sensible thing to do, but I don't think it's a socially sensible thing to do. Good. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? One down here at the front, please. Hi, Mark. Uh, Peter Stirrup from SEMSAT. Um, I was interested to get your, your view on what the challenge and opportunities posed by kind of the rise of artificial intelligence um, on the supply chain, both for kind of the construction industry and, and how Balfour BT are uh, embracing that. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, was, I didn't predict that one. My, it's interesting, actually. We, we, we in Balfour BT actually are, are developing artificial intelligence. So uh, you may or may not know that we have a suite of products that... Uh, that monitor the condition of the railway asset on a, condition, on a continuous basis. Uh, and over time, these, these things have evolved to become quite clever to predict failure. 
just ahead of the failure happening. That obviously optimizes your, your repair and avoids safety issues of putting people on track to inspect, etc. The next evolution of those products that we're now looking at is how do you get artificial intelligence into that software so that it, it learns from the things that it's seeing and kind of improves its own predictive capability. So it's kind of real, it's happening now. Hi Mark, uh, Riyadh from the IAT. Um, you mentioned uh, skills and a skills gap and also diversity. What, what can be done to actually improve the di and create a diverse team uh, within the, the rail network? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it's, it's something that increasingly I think is occupying uh, the minds of leaders in this industry and rightly so. Um, and, and diversity takes many, many shapes and forms. Uh, uh, maybe just for ease of debate, uh, if you look at gender diversity as one example. So in, the, in our business, and I think in the railways more broadly, there's about 16% female workforce. Why? Why only 16%? When you get into that question, though, and look at it, 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 I think it starts ultimately with, well, with the point I made when I was talking, actually, if this sector is attractive to people to want to come and work into it, that will naturally increase diversity anyway. So anything we can do to promote ourselves as a collective to make this a, a fascinating, interesting place for people to want to come to is great. But how do you attract that target audience? I was having a chat with somebody uh, yesterday, actually, in the uh, utility sector, and we were talking about this subject. And um, it, it, there was a great piece of insight there that I got, got from someone where we, where we were saying, you know, if we take a traditional approach to recruitment, for example, we kind of go and look in a certain place and the people who look in that certain place are the people who, who look like us today. The, the people who are the, the people we want to attract in, they go over there to look at where they find a job. And unless we kind of point you know, our, our recruitment efforts over there, they'll never see it. So there's some real kind of tangible, practical things like that we can do that, that'll make a difference. I think, you know, the younger generation with social media and all that kind of stuff as, as channels to communicate and influence and attract talent, I think will make a big difference. And I, I'm seeing a shift in that mode already. But I think it, I, I don't think we'll, uh, well, I know we won't fix this in my work in lifetime. You know, it, it'll take a generation to flush through the education system, uh, and apprenticeships and all that kind of stuff. So it'll take a long time to fix, but it, if we don't start somewhere, we'll never get to the end. You mentioned that uh, you have a couple of experience in the uh, aviation and other sectors. Uh, you are now in rail, if I can understand. So uh, how have you been able to get there, to rail? And uh, for people that are new to rail, what are the opportunities lying down for them to come in into rail? Um, I was fortunate, actually. I, I, I didn't plan a career in rail. Um, unlike some of my colleagues I work with who spent a lifetime in rail, whose brothers, sisters, fathers, uncles also work in the sector, I came in by accident. I had a chance to meet him with the chief executive of Balfour Beatty one day, and he offered me a job, um, which I was very pleased about. I've been there six years and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So I guess it, for me it was a bit of luck. But in terms of um, people getting into the sector, I think there are huge opportunities. Uh, you know, with the 48 billion being spent by Network Rail in, uh, in CP6, massive investment by TFL, HS2, Crossrail. I mean, it, the kind of, the limits are endless. I think people could come into rail today and spend an entire career in the sector and have a career that doesn't necessarily mean they do the same job for the next 30, 40 years. There's so much variety, so many different skills needed. I, I just think the possibilities are endless. Good, thank you. Well, time for one more. Uh, hello, it's John Anderson from Agreco UK Limited. Um, we're just invested in a uh, energy storage company called UNICOS, and I was wondering, do you see uh, opportunities for energy storage in the rail industry. So it's batteries, battery storage, and yeah, I, I do. And uh, where I've particularly seen this discussed, from my perspective, it actually has been on the underground. So talking about you know 
capturing the heat generated by braking to charge a battery to you know reclaim all that energy. Um, I'd like to think it would happen because it kind of makes sense, but you come across a lot of barriers around, well, it's too heavy, it's not aerodynamic, it affects the performance of the train, blah, blah, blah. I think ultimately anything that makes us more energy efficient kind of will come to the fore. But there's, there's going to be so many, it's like anything in our sector, isn't it? There's so many hurdles that you have to cross over to get there. It just seems to take forever. So you, you can take a good idea, but it, we seem to be talking about it still four years later. Doesn't answer your question, but that's kind of the way it is, I guess. Thank you very much. No, there are actually quite a lot of initiatives going on on that. There, I saw one the other day. They have um, piezoelectric uh, fan vanes on the roof of underground trains, which flap in the, in the wind going through the tunnels, which generate electricity, which light the stations. Yeah. So it's, 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 there's, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on, but it's some years away from deployment, I think, some of that stuff. And anyway, thank you all very much for attending. Uh, this is one of a series of talks we're running all day, so please come back uh, while you're enjoying your visit here to Infrail 2018. Thank you for coming, and thank you very much to Mark Bullock. Thank you.